When I was five years old, I was totally enamored with Star Trek. I wanted to go where no man had gone before. I wanted to have Scotty beam me up. And I wanted to wear those ridiculously cool outfits that they wore on the Starship Enterprise. But most importantly, I actually wanted to be Dr. McCoy. At age five, I knew that he used data to take care of his patients and to get the best outcomes. I understood that he mapped out disease, mapped out the physiology of the body, and he put that information together to cure his patients. The irony is that when you think about Star Trek, that was one of the earliest portrayals of precision medicine using data. <laughs> so, 50 years later, and yes, I am over 50, <laughs> I still love Star Trek, and I am considered a seasoned educator and surgeon, and I still really appreciate the value of data. I understand how it works in all of the care processes that I participate in, and it is the basic foundation for medical decision making. So simply stated, data facilitates excellence in patient care. What's really interesting is that there's actually one data type that's missing in the medical record, and that's haptic data. What healthcare providers and physicians actually do with their hands? And I'll give you a story that may help understand why it's important. One night I was on call in the emergency room and there was a critically ill patient that came in who had just been in a major motor vehicle accident. And as soon as we saw the patient, we thought, oh my goodness, this patient we're gonna have to crack the chest. So I look at my senior resident and I said, you get the scalpel, I'll prep the chest. We have to get in here really quickly. And she opened the patient's chest and his heart stopped beating. So she reached in and she starts squeezing and doing manual massage of the heart. And then it started beating in her hand and she let go and we watched for a second and then it stopped again. So she grabbed the heart again and started squeezing it and then it started beating and then it stopped again. I'm like, oh my goodness, let me take a feel. I want to see what's going on here. And I get my hands in there and as soon as I put my hand in the chest, I feel a hard blood clot on the anterior chest wall pressing against my hand and the heart. I asked for the Mets and bomb scissors, I cut the tissue open, and this dark blue clot comes out, and then I'm squeezing the heart, and then this time the heart keeps beating. And it's beating strong enough that the patient regains vital signs and then we have enough time to get to the operating room to take care of the rest of the injuries. When I <laughs> Thanks. When I think back to that experience, the irony is that everything was moving so fast. There wasn't an opportunity for me to have a teaching moment with the resident to figure out why they didn't feel the blood clot. Had they never felt it before? Did we not you know, teach them? Were their hands actually not really deep enough? And it's hard to tell. And that exchange, the things that we did with our hands to save that patient's life was not captured. There's no data. There's no data for me to train the resident. There's no data for me to share with my colleagues. This doesn't happen every day. This is a rare event. So there's probably some surgeon, you know, 10 years before me who had that one experience in their lifetime and we don't have the opportunity to share uh, that information. What I will tell you is that that data represents an opportunity for us to have a database of physician performance. And without that database, we actually can't 
shorten the learning curve or move more quickly uh, in terms of exchanging information and tips and tricks among surgeons. May sound like a far off thing, but I can tell you for us, we expect to have access to this data from athletes. This is data that has existed for over 60 years. We have baseball cards, we have dashboards. We won't even watch TV if there's no stats portrayed about what the athletes are doing. We follow their stats, we know it. The coaches use it, the players use it to guide their training. And think about the Olympics with no data. It just wouldn't happen. There's no such thing. So there is a framework and a mindset around performance measurement, haptic and motor data for human performance. And what we're doing in our research lab is actually now putting sensors on surgeons. And so we have sensors on their gloves sensors on their brain, sensors, any wearable sensor technology. We have tried it in the operating room, uh, in a simulated operating room, and we collect their data. And I can't just sit here and talk about the data without showing it to you. So what you see here on the screen is the motion data of a surgeon who is performing a simulated laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. The area that you see here is the hernia site. This is where the patient is located. The surgeon is located in this area and their hands are in the laparoscopic instrument and you can see the motion data going from the surgeon's hands to the hernia site. And then this other area is hands near the Mayo stand, which is a smaller uh, table that holds most of the most commonly used uh, surgical tools. Um, and then there's a bigger table in the back, but we wanted to capture just the mail stand because that's where all the quick action is between the surgeon and the scrub tech. This is the motion profile of an expert laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. And now I'll show you one that's not so expert. And when I show it to you, immediately you'll see a difference. So what you see here same regions labeled, but you start to see there's a lot more motion going on here near the Mayo stand. And you also see a lot of back and forth between the Mayo stand and the hernia site. And when you're doing laparoscopic surgery, if you're spending more time at the Mayo stand than you are with your hands in the laparoscopic instruments, something is going wrong. So what you notice is that there's also this whole other area of motion that's taking place that doesn't even appear in the top performer's motion profile. And it turns out that this person made a critical error at the beginning of the procedure. They made the skin incision a little too large, and every time they move the instruments a certain way, the laparoscopic instrument and the port would come out and then they'd have to put it on the mail stand, take the instrument out, put the introducer in, put it back in the patient. And they did this several times until they said, okay, this is crazy. Then they sutured the hole on the abdominal wall smaller so that the port wouldn't come out anymore. Now this wasn't detrimental to the patient, it just cost more time, but as you can see, we don't miss anything with this data. And if you had this data, we could capture the learning curve and shorten the learning curve between surgeons. What's also interesting is that if I had five top performers in this exact same procedure, their motion profile will look exactly the same because the level of efficiency and where the male stand is and where they're, they're standing with respect to the patient, those are fixed points. However, if I ask those five surgeons to explain to me what they did in that operation, you would hear five completely different explanations. Because when surgeons talk about what they do, they focus on what's most interesting to them in terms of the anatomy, and they focus on their instruments. We love our instruments. So we'll give you the story, and all the stories will be different. The motion data is the pure standard data that actually is better than verbal language to describe a surgical procedure. 
So verbal language is actually inadequate. Uh, data that's not standardized. So if you think about the motion data, it is pristine and it gives us an opportunity to do research and to do comparisons that we've never been able to do before. Ladies and gentlemen, what I have just shared with you is that there is a new data stream that can serve as an important addition to data that already exists in the medical record, and this will greatly facilitate the quality of care that we provide. Athletes have it, airline pilots have it, all the elite professionals have it, and in medicine, we've got a ways to go. Philanthropic support would accelerate our ability to use this across multiple specialties in healthcare, and we've done a lot of this work on federal grants. However, philanthropic support can accelerate it much faster uh, than we can with government funding. And I know I can't present this work without dispelling a very common myth. A lot of people think, oh, wow, that's really great data, but doctors don't want to be measured. Guess what? In the past 10 years of my research career, the physicians line up by the hundreds. I have thousands of physician data in my uh, database of performance with a variety of wearable technologies. And they want the data. They all want to be the best that they can be. They just don't want the data to be used against them before they have an opportunity to use it for their own improvement and for information exchange for training as well as sharing tips and tricks. Precision healthcare is here. And there is technology that already exists. The data is pristine. And the physicians are ready. Let's do this. Thank you.